some elections where you think, you know, really, I don't care if it's A or B. It doesn't matter that much to me. This is not one of those elections because this election is not about partisanship. This election is about protecting the institutions of American democracy. And so many of us, I anyway, can speak for myself to say that I didn't really ever think they would go away. I think I, I figured after World War II, we had put in place as a nation a series of institutions that would hold and that would hold regardless of whether Republicans were in power or Democrats were in power. And those institutions are now quite literally under attack. There is uh, the the Republican candidate for president who seems as if he is going to get the nomination, that is former President Donald Trump, has been quite articulate about his desire to tear down those institutions, to get rid of the idea that the president can be checked either by Congress or by the courts, to create a unitary executive that can do whatever he wants, to get rid of the nonpartisan civil service that we've had since 1883 and replace it with people who are loyal to him and carry out his wishes, even to suggest that he alone will have the opportunity to interpret the Constitution of the United States. When he says, for example, that he wants to get rid of birthright citizenship, that's something we've had since the late 19th century, and it was articulated and put into law in the 14th Amendment in 1868. We are literally looking at a small faction of Americans who want to destroy American democracy. So whether you're a Democrat or whether you're an independent or whether you're, you've are you got an R beside your name or anything else, this is your election to stand up for what you believe America stands for. Democracy uh, is on the ballot. And by democracy, I mean very simple things. I mean the things that the founders set out in the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And those are the right to equality before the law, and the right to have a say in your government. Now, those sound like they're almost no-brainers, but they have been under attack since they were first articulated, sometimes by the men who articulated them, in 1776, and they remain absolutely revolutionary. The idea that we all should have a right to a say in the government under which we live is absolutely not written in stone, certainly not in other countries, but also not in America any longer. And that's what's at stake in the 2024 election. Now, on that idea of democracy, on the idea of equality before the law and a right to a say in your government, rest two major ways to look at the world. One is the idea, and I can't emphasize how revolutionary and important this is, one is the idea that we live by a set of rules, that we live by the rule of law in the United States. That is, we all have the right to the same protections and the same responsibilities to the role of law. And as you know, to, to the rule of law, and as you know, that idea is under attack. And it's under attack quite literally by uh, Donald Trump, who is trying to destroy the idea that he should be um, responsible to the rule of law, but more than that, he is also undermining the idea that we have a rule of law by attacking the Department of Justice, by attacking prosecutors, by attacking juries, by attacking, uh, by attacking people who are going to testify in court. He is actively trying to undermine the rule of law. That matters. That matters to all of us because once we lose the rule of law, it's no longer a question of whether or not we are going to be held accountable for things we have done and also to have the protections of the law. What is really going to matter is what our relationship is to the people who are in power. And if you look, for example, at Viktor Orban's Hungary right now or Vladimir Putin's Russia, you see that your relationship to that leader and to the leader's policies means the difference between life and death for you and your families. That's never been what the United States as a whole has stood for. So on the ballot this year is to protect democracy in order to protect the rule of law at home, but also on the international scale to protect the idea of a rules-based international order. And that's something that we really haven't emphasized in the United States for a long time. I think because people thought after World War II, things like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or any of the many declarations that we have under the UN, the Declaration of Human Rights, for example, 
any of those international peacetime alliances that stop people from going to war against each other seemed as if they were solid. And while they have never been 100% effective, we have certainly had wars since World War II, they have managed to, uh, to manage, if you will, fighting between different countries, giving people uh, and, and governments a way to work out their differences without shooting at each other. And with the invasion of Vladimir Putin's Russia into Ukraine and the question of whether or not the United States and its allies and Ukraine's allies and partners will stand against that invasion. That is also on the ballot, whether we're going to have the rule of law at home and whether we're going to have a rules-based international order globally that will help to manage conflicts in such a way that we don't simply have to face the idea that big countries can do whatever they want, because that's in fact how we have gotten into world wars in the past. Those things are here and they're the ones that we're, we're having to deal with. Now, that being said, there's a lot to worry about right now in this country, and I'd be the first to admit it. But I would also say that as I travel around the country, what I see is something that really isn't getting a lot of attention. And that the reason that you're here, I think, or that the fact you're here emphasizes that there is something going on. And that is Americans have woken up to the fact that they are in real danger of losing American democracy. And they're coming together as a movement. And as I say, it's not a partisan movement necessarily, although today's Democratic Party is the one that embraces these concepts of democracy, while uh, the, the faction that is controlling the Republican Party now rejects them. It's a movement that brings in Democrats and independents and, and re either Republicans or Republican-leaning people who can say, you know, I might disagree with you about about finance, and I might disagree with you about immigration, and I might disagree with you about internal improvements. But by God, I can agree that I don't want to turn this nation over to a dictator. And in that movement, in that quiet movement around the country right now, I see something that looked, looks very much to me like the 1890s did. And in the 1890s, we had a system in which a few very wealthy men had taken over the American economy and by that power had also taken over the American government. And it really seemed like they were entrenched, that they were, that they had changed American democracy to be such a thing that they got to run everything. And interestingly enough, in 1888, they actually manipulate the Electoral College to put one of their representatives in the White House, even though he loses the popular vote. Lots of people forget that Benjamin Harrison, in fact, lost the popular vote by about 100,000 votes. But there's some machinations that happen in the Electoral College that year that enable him to become president anyway. And if you were living in America in 1889, when that administration added six new states to the American uh, uh, Union in order, as they quite openly said, to pack the Senate and the Electoral College so that they would never lose again. That's how we got South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Washington, and, uh, and if I didn't say Wyoming, that one, and Idaho. Idaho is the one I didn't say. That's how we got those six states. If you lived in the United States in January of 1890, you would think that this is the way things were always going to be. But something really interesting happened in 1890, and that's that Americans who were workers or farmers or entrepreneurs who couldn't fight their way into this closed system of industrialists started to talk to each other. And they started to say, you know, do you understand how tariffs work? You know, because I don't think they're doing us any favors. And do you understand how rebates work in the in the railroads? And wait a minute, do you understand who your senators are working for? And as they got together and made connections across really examining the way the government worked, they realized that they felt that the United States had gone off track, that it had become a plutocracy and that they needed to do something to bring it back. So they started to have picnics and they started to publish newspapers and they started to talk to their friends. And pretty soon letters start to go back from places like South Dakota back to Washington, where, where observers for the Republican Party say, you know, I think we got a problem out here. 
And by the summer of that year, they started to say, you know, we're not even running candidates because we can't get anybody to show up to our meetings. And still, the, the political parties back east, especially the Republican Party, said, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Those Westerners, there aren't that many of them. And, you know, they really do like us. It's just it's just they don't really know us well enough yet. And so in October of that year, the Republicans put through a very pro-business piece of legislation. And the Democrats say, you know, you're laughing now, but wait till November, you'll mourn. And what happens is that, in fact, quite out of the blue for Eastern observers, in the midterm elections of 1890, the alliance movement, as those people had come to call themselves, took the House by a vote of two to one, by a majority of two to one, took the Senate as well, and began to, to, to call themselves a new political movement. That movement becomes the, the populist movement in 1896. And by the early 20th century, they have put all of their demands into law because one of the major political parties picks up their arguments and the other one mirrors them. And they manage to change the course of American history and give us the progressive era. So when I look around at what's happening nowadays, at all the people who show up at a call like this, or at the many people who are turning out in one place or another and the places I'm speaking across the country, that's what I see. I see Americans saying, you know, we may not agree about a lot of stuff here, but we can agree that we care really profoundly about the about democracy, about the rule of law, and about the rules-based international order. Now, one of the things that, that I really would like to, to mention here, and then I'm happy to take questions, is that it's really important to remember that there are far more Americans who care about democracy than there are Americans trying to, to tear it down. So any political scientist will tell you that at the very height of a right-wing reactionary movement in any country, because that's how political scientists work, there are between 28 and 32 percent of the population that actually believe in the movement. That's the height of it, not the bottom. That's the height of it. What makes a movement like that able to take over a country, as they have done in so many countries, is that many people are cowed by them. You know, it's kind of like the fifth grade bully. As long as the fifth grade bully can convince everybody that he might beat them up, everybody keeps quiet and lets him and his gang run everything. But when that gang, the, the rest of the class gets together and pushes back, pretty soon the, the bully is the one who has been is the outcast and who has lost power over everybody else. And that's really important to remember in in this moment, because every statistic that we see, even about abortion and um, basic gun safety legislation and taxes and um, public schools and all the things that are considered hot button issues, statistics will, will bear out across the board that the vast majority of Americans share the same perception of them. That is, we would like common gun safety, uh, common sense gun safety legislation. We would like the right to reproductive rights. We would, we like our public schools. We like the things that have in the past made up the liberal consensus that we lived under between um, 1933 when FDR ushered it in until the present when it is now under attack from the MAGA Republicans. So it's important to remember that there are a lot more of us than there are of them, but we need to turn people out to vote. We need to turn people out to vote at every level in this election, because this election is going to be won by turnout. And it's going to be enormously important for this election not to be challenged. That is for the numbers to be so large that the MAGA Republicans cannot argue that they are that there's any confusion about what happens. So I'm so thrilled people are turning out to volunteer. I also want to emphasize that in this moment, and honestly, this is to me in a way the more important one. I'm an older woman. I've watched the world for a long time. And I know a lot of people are scared right now because there's so much horrible stuff going on, especially in Republican dominated states where people are losing their rights and their freedoms. And that's terrifying, terrifying even if you don't live in one of those states. But but I would like to emphasize that when you look at an era like the 1890s or the 1930s, for example, a time in which the order of the country is changing, that is the old guard is falling away and the new vision of the country is rising. It's a time not only of fear, but also of extraordinary creation. 
of creativity, of people coming up with new music and new art and new ways of looking at the world and new combinations and new politics and new economics. And you see that all around you too. And I find it an enormously empowering moment to think that rather than just simply fighting a holding action, as I've done for the last 40 years, we're actually creating something. And that joy, that idea that, you know, maybe it's not so much fun to stuff envelopes or to make phone calls or to uh, show up at Zoom meetings or to knock on doors or to do any of the things we have to do to get the, the turnout that we need in this election, that we're building something. And we're building something that puts us in line with the greatest moments in our history. You know, we are on the side of Fannie Lou Hamer and Booker T. Washington and Ida B. Wells and Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. You'll notice I didn't put Jefferson in there. Um, we've got behind us those phenomenal principles that everybody has a right to be treated equally before the law and everybody has a right to a say in their government. Those are principles that even in the 21st century, most people in the world don't live under. And the fact that we get to do that, we get to protect that. This is our moment to stand up and be counted as to what we think the ultimate goal of humanity is. The idea of self-determination and the right to determine the rules under which we live. That's exciting. As well as being in a frustrating and a frightening time, we are also in a time of extraordinary privilege because we get to make a difference, not only for ourselves and our towns and even our country, but also for the world. And that honestly is what keeps me going. And I think that that is a good way to think about what we're trying to do here. I'd also like to point out when you're when you're starting to volunteer, you know, one of the things that they talk about people said in 1930s Germany when they didn't speak up, when they didn't stop what was happening is, well, what can I do? I'm only one person. And the answer to that is make a friend. And then once you two have met, make another friend. And pretty soon you've got a whole group of people who can do things like show up at school committee meetings or town council meetings or can say, hey, wait a minute, what happened with that contract? And that's how you change things is to meet somebody and make a friend and start to talk about things and start to take up oxygen. So one of the things that I'm doing when I'm, I'm laughing because I was watching your names come up and like in many cases, there were at least two of you from the same town. And I knew one of those towns that went by and it's not that big a town. So I hope you know each other because one of the things that I think we're doing in all these volunteer ways in which we're working is we're making the United States a little bit smaller. After feeling for so long, like we didn't have agency, like we couldn't do things, like we didn't know people, like who lived in that state, we're realizing that there are a lot of us who are really decent people and have principles about what we believe this country should be and that we actually like to work together and that we can make a huge difference when we do. So I hope you all sign up to work for this election and sign your friends up. Make this a, a celebration that everybody wants to be part of. And one of the things about Volunteer Blue is they will help you find wherever you fit in that place of action. There's 24 different organizations here and they work from the local government on up, of course, to the, to the very top of the election scale. So thank you for being here. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm thrilled to be part of this movement. And I hope that after you know this pep talk, you will stay on this call after I shut up and continue to move into the breakout rooms because one of the things that always jumps out to me is that you know, I'm just the coffee pot that you all are gathering around. And I am so proud and so pleased and feel so privileged to be a part of this movement. And I want you all to meet each other and go out and do the great things that I know we can all do together. So thank you for being here. And I'll turn it back over and answer any questions. Well, thank you, Heather. We do have time for questions. So put them in the chat. We'll do our best to ask, uh, answer them, pose them and have Heather answer them. And as you write your questions, I, I do want to do one thing. I want to draw your attention to the link in the chat where you can purchase Heather's latest book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. It's a great book and every one of us should be buying it and reading it. Um, let's start with some questions. Um, Heather, um, What? Let, let me just pose one. What do you think um, the role of abortion rights will play in, in this election and how historic is the struggle over that freedom. 
It is huge. The Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization decision of June 2022, which overturned the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision providing a, a constant, not providing, recognizing a constitutional right to abortion, is the first time in American history that the courts have acted, that the courts have acted to deprive people of a formerly recognized constitutional right. And I put that very carefully because, of course, the courts have deprived, especially minorities, of rights in the past, but they were not rights that had previously been identified as constitutional rights. So um, so this is the first time that's happened. It was settled law for 49 years. And I think that, that what's really interesting about the Dobbs decision is that it relegates more than 50% of the population to a, a different kind of status than they had enjoyed for 49 years. It took away freedoms took away rights, it took away freedoms. And in such a way that it affects, of course, not only women, but but everybody in the United States. And I think it illuminates for a lot of people that the the right the far right Republican extremists really do intend to take away our rights. And if they can take away abortion rights, what's next? Where does that stop? Where is that line? And I don't think we know where that line is. So I think that's really, really big. Um, and I think you can see it. I think you can see it in how many people have turned out. I've called it our Kansas Nebraska moment, which I won't bore you with, but I think that's what's happening here. I will say one of the questions that I keep seeing come through here again and again is um, how important is it to speak up on social media because the the far right is lost. Those are two separate questions. The the far right that let's I'll even give you thirty percent of the American population is not going to be their minds are not going to be changed between now and November. They've been poisoned by a lot of right wing media for a long time. They are not reachable, but at least now. But remember, there's 70% of the American population that is. And I just read Arnold Schwarzenegger's new book, and he says something really interesting about January 6th. And with that, he said, you know, he watched those people storming the Capitol on January 6, 2021. And felt very sorry for them, him because, he, of course, he grew up in Austria where the older generation in his town had participated in the, the Nazi, everything the Nazis did during World War II and were former Nazis. And they lived with that from then on. And he recognized what uh, a trip down, down to the bottom that was. And he said he realized then that if the media had managed to get him or if certain media channels had managed to get those people through um, through uh, Facebook, through all the different forms of social media, he could also reach them in that way. And so he started really reaching out over different kinds of social media to those people. And I think to this day, he's the only person who has really deliberately gone after them rather than saying, don't join them. He's actually gone after them and said, this is a mistake for you to join. But I would say our goal, the way you change the ship of state, the way you turn its, its helm, is by taking up oxygen and you take up oxygen anywhere you possibly can. And that's not to say that you're somebody's gonna meet you at the grocery store and throw their arms around you and say, yes, you changed everything I thought. But what it does mean is the more people hear that who have not made up their minds, the more they will say to themselves, hey, maybe I'm not the only one who thinks this way, or I really like her. I, you know, I'd really like to, to talk to her more about that. And you're going to open more minds that way. So absolutely take up oxygen everywhere you possibly can, including social media. All right. Uh, the questions are coming fast and furious. So I'm trying to group a number of them. There seem to be a bunch around disinformation and your thoughts about the role that's playing and how to counter it. Well, that's I think I think I pretty much just answered that disinformation is huge. It is we know an, a, a long standing thing among um, those who wish us ill, including in other countries who are trying not only to, to lie, but also to throw so much crap at us that we can't we just tune out. We can't we just can't handle it any longer. And when that happens, even to, to you, to people on this call, um, it's worth stepping back and saying, listen, there are things I believe, and there are facts in this world, 
And instead of arguing about, you know, what's going on up here with the, you know, the right to have a dishwasher that works and what Congress is doing, what is my absolute belief about what democracy should be and what are the facts? And to the degree that we can keep highlighting facts, we're not alone anymore, although I do think uh, the power is in the hands of the people. Certainly the media that used to just say, well, Trump said this and Biden said this and they're both old and all that. Um they're starting actually to call out disinformation increasingly. People like Jake Tapper, for example, are calling that out. So I don't think we're any longer um, whistling into the wind, but um, but it is important to call it out and to recognize that at the end of the day, we can reach more people on a one-to-one -one basis than virtually anybody else. And any organizer will tell you that's how you change minds is you talk to your friends more than having some national platform where, that's playing in the background. And there are a couple of questions around third parties, uh, Kennedy, et cetera. Any thoughts on, on the role they may play, the danger they may pose? Third parties have two roles in the United States. One is to highlight um, uh, positions and principles that the major parties are not doing. And, and I could talk about why it's, it is very unlikely to, that a third party is actually going to beat the Democrats or the Republicans in the system the way we have it now, but that's really not what you're asking. Uh, they either bring up new ideas that have not been brought up by those major parties, or they are spoilers. And in this particular election, the people who are running, and that would be Cornell West and Jill Stein and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., are spoilers. And what that means is they are actually quite articulately, in the case of Kennedy, trying to draw votes away from Biden with the hope of throwing the election into the House of Representatives, which could happen under the 12th Amendment, where each state gets a single vote. And in that case, if the Republicans have dominated more states than the Democrats have, Trump will be legally elected, even if he loses the popular vote by a, by a huge number. So in this election, voting for a third party is a vote for Donald Trump. That's not to say one should never vote for a third party, but the, the, the example we're using now, and I guess I've never written about this, I should, is the election of 1844. And in that election, there were two candidates running, Polk, who was staunchly behind the idea of human enslavement, and he was a Democrat, and Henry Clay, who was a Whig, who didn't like human enslavement, but he at the time was himself an enslaver. He was about to, to free his enslaved neighbors, but... Um, but the, uh, the those two were running, and in New York, a group of people said, "I can't, I can't deal with this. I can't vote for either one of these people who like human enslavement." So they voted for a third party, a James Bernie, his name was, because he was absolutely abolition, you know, against enslavement and pro abolition. About four thousand votes in the state of Virginia, I'm sorry, the state of New York, threw that election not to to Clay, but rather to Polk, and Polk then expanded human enslavement enslavement across all of the American, what was then the Southwest, went to war with Mexico, took a whole bunch of new land, and um, and enslavement increased uh, across the country until we had a much larger American South. And of course, we had human enslavement last for another 20 years. And Clay almost certainly would not have done that. So when you think somebody like Robert Kennedy in this election, think James G. Burney and think, I, I, I can't do it because I, if I do that, yeah, maybe I'll win on November in November, but the country is going to lose for the rest of its history, really. There are a bunch of questions about younger. Michael, Michael, just one last one last question. Okay. Then we need to say. So one last question, Heather, and um, there are a bunch of questions about younger voters and younger people and their attitudes. And I don't know if you have any thoughts that you want to share. Um, I do. The, the poll don't. First of all, don't pay attention to the polls. Young people adore Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, the Biden administration has a number of youth ambassadors who are doing a great job. I'm not worried at all about the youth, except that we need them to turn out. So get people to turn out. I want to say something different, which is really interesting. And that is, you know, what's been the surprise in this election is older voters Older voters are switching now pretty dramatically behind the Democrats and behind Biden because we do not want our children and our grandchildren to grow up with fewer rights than we had. So the youth is important, 
But what we really need to do is to, to make sure we, of course, turn out younger people, but we speak to those older people that we might not think are paying that good attention and make sure that they get out because they've been the huge surprise in the last several months in this election. So absolutely, the youth are there. They're concerned right now about the youth is, is likes, likes Biden, they like Harris. They're, of course, upset right now about Gaza and what's happening in the Middle East. That situation is changing extraordinarily rapidly. And so I think it's really too quick to quick to say that whatever happens has happened in the last several months is going to carry over into November because we simply don't know what's going to happen in the next several months there, which is going to give us an entirely different picture of um, of how the youth is the youth, the youth is going to jump in 2024. Heather Cox Richardson, I cannot thank you enough uh, for today, but also for your book, for your Substack, for your wisdom, your guidance. Um, you are uh, someone that we all depend on and all of us want to express our enormous appreciation for the work that you've done and will continue to go do and uh, the guidance you'll offer. Well, thank you, but back at you. I really am just just the coffee pot that all these amazing people are gathering around. And it's so exciting to be part of it. I mean, we're making history here. And for a historian, there is literally no better place to be. I'm, I'm going to jump off this call um, and not stay around to talk to people because you'd be shocked to hear I have a letter to write. And Today is, of course, the anniversary of the firing on Fort Sumter. So um, so this is one that needs to be good. Um, thank you. So, so thank you for having oh. me. And I'm going to jump. All right. Take care. Take so care. I hope everybody else will stay. Um, we're going to do just a couple of quick things. We're, we're going to give you a quick sense of the battleground map. And then we're going to break into uh, these breakout rooms, uh, which will allow you to really dig into the volunteer opportunities that will allow us to make history. On the Volunteer Blue website, there's a calendar with all the most effective volunteer opportunities, as well as the ability to book one-on-one -on -one coaching for anyone who doesn't know how to make the best use of their time. And there's also a listing of the critical races. The compelling truth of the upcoming election is it is not a single national election. Who occupies the White House will be determined by what happens in six to seven states the control of the Senate by the votes in three to four states, the House by the outcomes in no more than 20 to 40 specific races. Before we head to the breakout rooms, the Volunteer Blue team will briefly share the battleground map. It's imperative that we focus on the most strategic states and races. That means we need to know what those are. Volunteer Blues, Michelle Olson and Rena Schnur will quickly brief us. Michelle and Rena. Thank you, Michael. Hold on one sec while I share out the screen. There we go. And before we get started, I just have to say, I thought Heather Cox Richardson was amazing and I hope you all did too. I feel incredibly inspired. Um, but with that, I, I, as Michael said, we just wanna take a few minutes to review uh, for you the most crucial states for the presidential, the Senate and the House elections coming up. Um, and we're hoping this will better enable you to decide exactly where to focus your efforts. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, as it's top of mind for everybody, let's start with the key races in the presidential election. Rena? Hi, everybody. So uh, what you see in the map, the purple states are swing states that Biden won in 2020, with Georgia and Arizona being the new surprise of 2020. North Carolina, is hoping to be the new surprise in 2024. But even if North Carolina remains red and all the other states are split in the way that we expect them to split, next slide, thank you, Biden will still have to win 44 electoral college votes from these six toss-up states. The likely path to victory is winning Pennsylvania and winning Michigan, and then winning at least one of the three states, Wisconsin, Arizona, or Georgia. It's very doable, but it's also very tight. So let's remember 
that the collective winning margin of Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona in 2020 was 44,000 votes. Moreover, five of these six toss-up states have a key Senate race. Michelle? Yeah, so let's look at the Senate. Um, it will come as no surprise to most of us on the call uh, that the Senate is very precari precariously held right now by the Democrats, 51 to 49 with Joe Manchin's retirement coming up and its inevitable Republican replacement, um, we'll be facing a 50-50 composition headed into the election. And right now there are just seven races that are considered competitive in this cycle. And every single one of them is currently a democratically held seat. In other words, Democrats are playing a defense game. The loss of any one of these seats will result in Democrats losing control of the Senate. As Rena mentioned, five of these races are also in presidential swing states. So the work that gets done there will be doubly important as it will benefit both races. Um, in the swing states, we've got Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, along with Arizona and Michigan. And then there are also two other Democratic incumbents in states that Trump won in 2020. There's John Tester in Montana and Sherrod Brown in Ohio who desperately need our support. I'll also mention that there is, are races in Texas with Ted Cruz and in Florida with Rick Scott. Um, both of those Senate races, some people are considering possible flips. However, right now the numbers there are really very daunting and they are long shots at best. However, given the recent changes in the abortion landscape, it, it's possible that that could change um, in the coming months. Um, let's turn to the House, where things are somewhat more sanguine. Uh, right now, Republicans have almost as precarious a lead there as Democrats have in the Senate. The current makeup is 218 Republicans versus 213 Democrats. However, we've got a few special elections coming up and some redistricting that's going to result in some certain flips. So most likely we'll be headed into the voting booths with 213 Democrats versus 222 Republicans, which means if we wanna flip the house, we need to flip five seats. Uh, looking across the country, there are 43 races that are currently considered competitive. They're spread across 24 different states. Um, the table there on the left summarize the, summarizes them by party. Um, as you can see, Democrats will be defending a few more seats. However, importantly, both parties have 11 races that are currently rated as a toss up. And it's from these that a flip would be most likely to occur. And five seats is of course ambitious, but it is certainly doable if you look at what happened in 2018, for instance. Um, and when we look for a strategy, two states on, really stand out on this map. And these two are ones that we don't often think of as swing, that being California and New York. Each of these two states actually have four Republican seats that are currently rated as toss up. And New York has an additional one that's actually rated lean D. So if we outperform in those two states and hold our own in the others, we could actually flip the house. Um, so let's look at some of the factors that could actually influence that outcome. Rena? So there are the usual factors and you can see uh, more details about them on the key races page on volunteerblue.org. But this year, we have the reproductive freedom as a unique mobilizing issue with abortion confirmed or about to be confirmed to being on the ballot in those states that you see colored on the map. And prominent among them are Arizona, who of course reinstated the 160 year old uh, ban this week, Nevada, Montana with a key Senate race, New York, with key house races and Florida. So it is up to us to utilize this voter turnout potential to the max. How are we going to do it? You will all hear about it in the breakout rooms. Thank you, John.
No, oh, thank you, Rena. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're about to head to the breakout rooms, um, but I, I want to say the breakout rooms will give us a chance for you to really delve into the possibilities of how you can make history. And we've all heard how critical it is that we work to win this election, and we know this, that our democracy is at stake. And when our children and grandchildren ask us, as they certainly will, what did you do in the time of Trump when American democracy was most at risk? We must answer, we did everything we could. To help you find the right opportunities to work to win this election, we have a set up breakout rooms. Here's our wonderful Volunteer Blue Zoom producer who's done a great job today trying to handle overflow crowds, John Weiser to explain exactly how to join a breakout room. Before he does that, let me say if there are people who are on the live stream, we now have room for 60 people to come back into the Zoom and uh, unfortunately live stream can't join the breakout rooms, but if you come back into the Zoom, you can. John, walk us through how to join the breakout rooms. Absolutely, and actually Michael, we now have 125 spots. So everybody who's on live stream can join us now. Uh, come back to the webinar and uh, come to the uh, live stream. So the, what's going to happen is there are 11 separate breakout sessions plus the main room, the room we are in now, um, and they are uh, Register Democrats Save the World, Using Social Media for Good, Arizona, Let's Turn This Purple State Blue, Turning North Carolina Blue Up and Down in 2024, How We Will Win Pennsylvania in 2024, the path to the house runs through California. New York is now a battleground, helping voters vote, ride share to vote, neighbor to neighbor, innovative relational door knocking, the youth vote, and turbocharge your voter outreach with bluevoterguide.com. If you really have no idea what you want to do, or if, and there will be a few folks, you know, that the, the technology just won't work. You won't be able to leave the main room. You'll want to go to a breakout, but you'll be stuck. We have wonderful people in the main room who are going to talk a little bit about coaching and some other opportunities to help you figure out what you'd like to do. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to turn on a poll, and the poll will show up on your screen, and you get to pick uh, anyone you like. You, of course, can't pick main room. If you do nothing, you'll just stay in the main room. But you'll pick these, and then you'll click on Submit. Uh, for hosts and co-hosts, as I mentioned before, you won't be able to fill out the poll. You'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, then what's going to happen is uh, once you get done with the poll, I'll open the breakout rooms, and you will see an invitation on your screen to join uh, the breakout room of your choice. If you are a co-host or you can't fill in the poll, you can look to the bottom right where there's likely three dots over more, and, and you will be able to click on that and breakout rooms will come up and you can join them. If there is a problem, and I do expect with a thousand people that there are some folks for whom it just won't work, um, then put the room number you want to go to in the chat. We have people signed up to look for you in the chat and move you. Um, and, or if you're like, if you're experienced, you can even rename yourself with the room number before your name. So we'll just look at the list of names and see uh, who is left. But in, in some way, we will get you into those breakout rooms. Uh, then once you wanna leave the breakout room, you can look at the bottom right and click on leave. And this will pop up, leave breakout room or leave meeting. If you click on leave meeting, you'll leave the meeting entirely and, and we'll lose you. So just click on leave breakout rooms. The breakout rooms are going to run for about 20 minutes, and during them you'll get lots of information, plus we're going to have an info form for you to fill out so we can get back with you about whether you want phone banking or texting or canvassing, fundraising, postcarding, others. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things for you to choose. So uh, with that, I am going to open up the polls, and uh, we're going to go uh, right now to the polling. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. You should see the polls come up on your screen now. All right, go right ahead and fill it out. I can see you're filling it out. That's great. All right. 
Now I'm going to leave it open for a minute or so, and then I will uh, close it. Okay, it looks like you have, um, you're all set. Okay, you should be able to see the results. And now create the breakout rooms. And open them. Okay. Excuse me, John, I'm not seeing the option to join the Pennsylvania room. Okay, I'll move you. Thank you. John, you're going to have to move me as well. I don't seem to be able to get to the Arizona breakout room. Nor and can I. I don't think any of the co-hosts are able to. Right. Um, yeah, you, me you neither. Can't a, you, you can't see a, a join breakout rooms? No. No, no. no it doesn't uh, allow it. Yeah, never mind. Okay, so... Uh, just give me a sec, guys. Uh, can you can you move yourselves? Can you see the anything at no, all? No, we, we cannot. cannot. We cannot. Okay. cannot. I'm sorry. Okay, guys. I'm trying. Just... Okay, Linda, where do you need to go? Uh, I need to go to California. I think Number if you two. scroll way down, you can see it. Way scroll way down. No, not in the breakout rooms. I don't see it. That's, I'm not seeing California or anything. Yeah. Yeah, we see the poll, but we can't join through the poll. the poll. Yeah. What number is is the California? So if you click more, if you click more and then scroll down all the way on breakout rooms and X out of the poll, you should be able to hit join. X out of okay. the poll. All right. I see relaunch poll, share results. Linda, what number is the California room? Uh, now I closed the poll, so I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. California. Two, if anyone can send Gary to number two. Does anyone know what number California is? It's I can sec. send to number seven for New York. California <laughs> is six. California is six. Everybody scroll down. When you get the, the breakout room dot, scroll yeah. all the way down. You can join. And yes. just scroll all the way down on this window that shows the breakup room. I'll move to, yes. Okay, all yes. the way down. Join, join. You all have a join option. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, so who, the, let me know, people, you could put you in. see this. I can't get into the room. I can't Mary, get into the room. Which, which room? I mean, yep. I need to, we need to go into Mary, room. you're going to 10, right? Mary Hansen, you're going to 10, right? 11, which is Blue Voter Guide. 11. What's your What's your name? I don't see you. you I Blue put Voter asterisk guide. Blue Voter Guide room 11. Thank you. That was so excellent. Could you okay. please? Put Andre Charles room six for Calvin. Andre Charles room six. Got it. Okay. Next up, who's up? Who's still missing? Sam Weinberg, where do you want to go? Gary. Sam Weinberg wants to go to 11. Do you vote? And thank you to those who are drop dropping what room you'd like to go to in the chat. Please keep doing that, and we will be working on adding you. I would love to go to room two. Gary, you want to go to room two? Yes. Thank you. Gary, what's your name? Gary, I don't see you. Gary, G. I got it. Okay. You got it? Okay. Um, what happened to room 10? Thank you for those dropping in the chat. What like what room you'd like to go to? We are working on moving you there. Pamela McAfee, where would you like to go? 
I'm where I belong. I'm supposed to help other people. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Sam, uh, you want to go to 10. Sam. Sam. Oh, he's, he's moved. Okay, good. Um, I think we are done with the calls. Scott Elner wants to go nope. to room six. Rena, we have to move the people in the chat to their room. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah. yeah. Police room six. Should we start for those staying in the main room? Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Bauer. I'm with Volunteer Blue. And for those of you staying in the main room, what we wanted to do was sort of provide an in-depth look at our Volunteer Blue website and the flexible tools that are on it that you can use to take action. And then we wanted to cover our personalized coaching program, either for your own use, or you may want to share this information with others or with groups that you're part of. And throughout this presentation, please put any questions in the chat, either about Volunteer Blue or topics we cover, and we'll turn to that at the end of the session. So now I wanted to ask uh, Linda to share a bit about the Volunteer Blue website. Linda, you're on mute. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, from my decades of experience in educational systems, I know that effective workplaces or communities need active engagement from members of the entity if the entity is to survive. Our democracy is no different. It needs active participation. My involvement with Volunteer Blue relates to the mission and approach of the organization, a commitment to democratic values, collaborative volunteering, and voter engagement. So I'd like to take you to a little tour of the website along the way and draw attention first to the navigation bar at the top where you can see um, it, the, the site is scheduled, is designed to make it easy for you to find things without too many clicks and to provide you with all the information and tools you need to get your volunteer information to get your schedule organized. Um, I also don't, at the top, there's also a donate button. The donate button does stand out. Know that Volunteer Blue is a top-down volunteer effort, but we do have expenses for things like the website. Financial contributions, large and small, are welcome. At the bottom of the homepage, you will see um, our partners. And if you click on those um, graphics, you will be taken to the partner website. So what I'm gonna to try to do first is to say, let's assume that you haven't been to our website before. So let's get started. And <clears throat> the first page you get up with is, first you get connected. Uh, you can sign up for an account at Volunteer Blue. So it makes it easier for you to keep track of things and also to get in and out of the website. Now it asks you for a little bit of information personally. Um, I have to tell you that we don't inundate you with emails. We don't, um, ask you constantly for donations, but we will send you um, periodic emails about what's going on, what races are hot, what news is happening, and that you can use um, that to um, adjust your volunteer efforts. So at the bottom of this page, so if we leave this page and we go to back to the page, it gives you a set of activities that you can that you can join. For example, let's go to social media because we've talked about that a lot. Um, on the social media page, you can become an influencer for democracy. You may say, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, it's easy. Um, you just click on Facebook, for example, and you can um, see that there are a whole lot of, um, there will be at some point, um, uh, scripts that you can use and that you can adjust so that you can um, send communications via a variety of uh, via a, a variety of um, platforms, whether it's Twitter or X and uh, WhatsApp, LinkedIn or Instagram. 
So I'm going to go back to the um, main page and I'm going to take um, a little bit of time to look at um, the key races page and uh, to look at um, the learn page, which is really, I think, a real a real important thing. Now, you heard previously that um, there are key races in, in the country, and you've seen this map. Um, there's a, the presidential swing states. Um, we get a sense of which of those states are um, have a, a PDI, which is a measurement of how partisan that district is. Um, further down, you can see Senate races, House races, and get some sense as to who's running. And in the House races, you also get some information about the um, financial uh, activity in those. So if I go back to learn, and then one of the things that I think is really um, important that we do that's, I think, kind of special is that we give you uh, the opportunity to also learn. You might not know anything about canvassing or texting, um, or you might have heard the term relational organizing, and we want to know more about that. So Volunteer Blue has structured a bit of an educational program for you to be able to do that. Um, so what is relational organizing? And there's some information, and then there's even a video that you can, that you can click on in order to go and get the information that will enhance your uh, particular um, interest. So in the how to section, you might find, for example, Slack. And I will admit that I'm a relatively new user on Slack. So it's been really helpful for me to be able to look at a little tutorial about how Slack works because it's a shared workspace and a lot of organizations use Slack to keep in touch with. So. Volunteer Blue has a lot of things that you can do, a lot of information that you can find, but the heart of our website is the calendar. The calendar is a collection of events that are offered by our various partners. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to load because there's it's chock full of information. So on the calendar, you can by month, so you can find events by month. You can find events by action type. Oh, you're interested in canvassing. Well, that's great. Or you're interested in working for a specific state, and maybe Arizona's on your on your on your hot list. Um, you can. You're not. Don't have to commit to anything. Um, this is all for your information. You may want to work for um, the House or the Senate seats that are up or you may want to work for a particular organization. So if you click on All In for North Carolina, it will take you to the events that All In for North Carolina has posted on, on, the, on our website. So the website itself is a great, a great way for you to find information, whether you do it or other people use it. Um, it's important for you to be able to go back periodically and say, okay, what's happening now? Or I, I don't really like phone banking anymore. I think I'll try texting. Um, or maybe postcarding is your thing. Or maybe you don't know what it is that you wanna do. So one of the things that Volunteer Blue has has done, and I think it's, it's special actually, um, Volunteer Blue has a cadre of action coaches, people who have been volunteers and are willing to um, work with others to help those folks get settled on what a good course of action is for them. This involves the person who wants to volunteer. You might not know what you wanna do, but you kind of have a sense of how much time you have and maybe a, a region that you're interested in, or a particular office, or maybe you have um, a particular interest in a, um, a topic and you want to work for a candidate or in an organization that is dealing with that. So you can make a, a, an appointment at your leisure with an action coach. And what happens then um, will be um, hopefully an educational and a, um, a relationship building activity. 
And Kristen is going to share a little bit more um, about that with us. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, well, I think Linda covered a lot of it, but I just wanna reinforce that we've developed this coaching program so that anybody in the country can sign up for a time that works for them for an individualized 20 minute coaching session with a really experienced election volunteer. And the goal of these kinds of sessions is kind of to elicit what the person's strengths are, what their interests are, and match them up with an activity or a program that really suits these and the time that they have available. So often we get people who come on, they wanna know what is, what's really most effective? What would be most effective for them given their particular situation? And I saw some questions early in the chat like that too. So we're happy to talk through that. Sometimes we get people who are heading up other groups of volunteers and they just wanna know um, what can they offer their volunteers? And we're happy to work with you. Sometimes we get people who are in very, very red states and they wanna feel a sense of connection with other volunteers, other blue volunteers, and have a chance to talk through what they're experiencing. So coaches can really offer a wide range of support. And maybe those of you on this call already know exactly what you wanna work on and that's great. You can go to the calendar that Linda explained and find what matches you and get started. But if you don't know, or if you have a friend who isn't sure where to start, please encourage him or her to sign up for a coaching session. Or if you're part of a larger organization, please feel free to spread the word. Coaches are available. It's easy. You can see the page there. You just pick the time period you want and a Zoom a link is sent to you and you meet with the coach one-on-one. -on -one. So to sign up, you just go to the web page, go to that part where you know it says I'm new here and go to coaching. So Loie can stop sharing and see if there are any questions in the chat, but I don't think I saw any. Uh, Rena, did you want to add anything or Linda? I just want to say that I'm an action coach and it's been a fantastic experience. I've met some really interesting people. Um, some of whom have never volunteered um, in an election environment before, and they just want to help. And so it's it's um, reinforcing for me as a volunteer, but it's also um, very helpful. It's an educational activity, and it's a great way to meet interesting people. And I saw we do have a question about what suggestions do you have for someone starting a new group? And we have a lot of experience with that. I think it depends a lot on what kind of um, group of people you're aiming for, what they're comfortable with. So that's exactly the kind of thing that signing up for a coaching session would be really useful because then we can delve in to the specifics of where you are, what kind of group you're appealing to, and help you start um, getting sort of a curated list of volunteer opportunities for your group. But Rena, did you have a comment? Well, I just wanted to say that I was like all of you, didn't know anything about even politics. Uh, I joined a few years ago in 2017 or 2018, but um, you, you'll get there. All of you, uh, it's not too difficult and it's very rewarding and it's so essentially needed. Um, and And you meet lots of great people all like you that just want to take some action. And, and we are here to help. You can always email us, chat with us, have coaches. Um, we, we all have been in the same place and, and we are still in the same place, just looking to do something to help. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. You may only have an hour a week or your friend may only have an hour a week. An hour is better than nothing. Um, so it's it's not how much time, it's what you do with that time that counts. And I think the Volunteer Blue Partnership uh, Group and, and certainly the Hub, which is our calendar, will help you make those decisions that you can effectively use your time uh, to do to feel good because you'll feel good after you talk with people and 
Uh, I didn't know anything about texting last year. And so I decided to join a texting bank and it was amazing how, um, and I even got some responses and had some nice, um, some nice discussions with people um, via texting. And I think we can all be inspired by our speaker to know that democracy is really on the line this time. So I would encourage everybody uh, to think about sort of extending yourself and going one step beyond. So if you did phone banking last time, consider taking on another tactic. And again, you can have a coach to help you learn how to do that. If you did postcarding last time, maybe you want to extend to phone banking, but just stretching ourselves and doing one more effort um, might be a way to go. Rena. And I just want to say there may be people here that just couldn't get to the breakout room, but they have been involved or they have been we taking will. action. So, uh, A, you can put in the chat what you've been doing. And also, um, we we need some help. In You have other skills, right? You, we all bring our skills from other worlds or other professions. So we need some help with different things. I'll put my uh, email in the chat. And you can uh, email me at any time. And I understand the breakout sessions are going to go for just a couple more minutes. So uh, in probably just a few minutes, everybody will be coming back and we'll go through some of the closing. But if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. You can see that we at Volunteer Blue are really looking for graphics and tech people. So if we have somebody like that, please just put, put it down or write to us directly. So I, I want to let you know that the it, it took a while for us to get everybody into the rooms. And so we're allowing the rooms to run another, they're going to run for about another 10 minutes. Well, I'm going to ask them to stop in five minutes, but they won't. And so I think 10 minutes is probably pretty reasonable. So uh, we'll uh, just keep, you know, we have, that means we have time for questions. And time to reflect on our speaker. So, um... There's a question about whether there's a recording of the meeting since some people missed the beginning of the meeting. And yes, there will be a recording. Yes, there is a shared. recording uh, and um, uh, we will send it out a link to that recording. Uh, we'll have it. Everybody who registered will get a follow up email that includes a link to the recording. And also a link to uh, a lot of the information. We shared some links uh, throughout. So what you will get is uh, uh, all the links and all the information that we shared. And, and I see some, that. Sorry, we have some people that put in the text in the chat that they want to text or that one um, is interested in registering people to vote. Those are exactly the kinds of things you can put in the calendar and filter it by what if you just want to do texting then use that as a filter and just the texting opportunities will come up and you can see which one suits your timing or if you uh, i think the other person was interested in registering uh, people to vote and get them to the polls again you can use the filtering system uh, to see what's possible there so that the calendar is really powerful really encourage you um, to go ahead and take a look at that and sort of go through the different ways you can filter. Right. One other thing you can do is you can use the um, an, an activity as a social thing. Um, we've had in my uh, my little group in town, um, we've had postcarding parties where it's pizza and politics. So we munch on pizza and we write postcards and um, we enjoy each other's company and um, have a good time while we're also doing something that's rewarding and worthwhile. So I have a question for you while we've got a few people here. Um, Linda or Rena, could you describe for people the uh, experimental uh, relational uh, recruitment app that we're going to be testing at Volunteer Blue? Rena, do you want to take a shot at it? Sure. So we're going to test um, a new app. Uh, it's called Swipe Blue. And really it's geared to, so relational organizing um, counts on the fact that people are more likely to uh, listen to their friends 
or contacts than to a stranger. So it's usually to uh, contact voters and say to register to vote or to go to vote. Uh, but we are using it to actually recruit volunteers like you. So when you become a volunteer, we want you to also recruit your friends and family to become volunteers. Because as you heard from Heather and I'm sure others, we really need all hands on deck. So um, it's uh, pretty easy. Uh, you go to Swipe Blue, you uh, download the app and you uh, put the code VOL for Volunteer Blue, VOL. And then you become, uh, you, you will see our space in Swipe Blue and we will create campaigns. One of the campaign that you will see active there is recruiting people to this particular event we are in now. And so we'll create more events. We are now testing it. We tested it with this event a little bit with some friendlies here but we are going to expand it. And so if you want to become part of the initial Swipe Blue uh, users for us, with us, uh, please, uh, again, I'll put my uh, email in the chat in a second again. Uh, email me and we'll, and, and you can just join the, the app as well and see the campaigns. And then you, when you, ready to do it when we have a campaign we let you know and you just uh click on it and you um you it matched all your contacts and you may need to do a little bit of cleanup but once it did it does not record your contacts it does not share your contacts it doesn't save your contacts you will just be able to click and send messages either with whatsapp or with um just text messages to your uh, contacts and it will come like it's a message, a, a regular text from you. And it's very friendly, very personal and very useful. I think it's important to realize that, you know, when you get a, sometimes you get a phone call, a lot of people don't even answer the phone anymore if they don't recognize the number. But if somebody you know gets a text from you, then they're more likely to read it. And then one of the things you can ask them to do is to share with other people their text. So if one person talks to 10 people via a text message and those 10 people engage with 10 other people, that's 100 folks. And that's a lot of volunteers. So I think it's a really interesting app. And I like to enforce the fact that that was my biggest concern when I started using the, the app was, um, what are they going to do with my contacts? And they do nothing. They don't keep them. They don't store them. They don't do anything. So it remains your private information. As a sidebar, the other thing that it helped me do was to clean up my contact list uh, on my phone, save some space. I think we've got everybody back from uh, the breakout rooms. I hope the breakout rooms were helpful uh, for people to be able to start finding the volunteer opportunities. You can always find the organizations and the volunteer opportunities at Volunteer Blue. And also we will do our best to send an email to all of you with a link to the recording of Heather Cox Richardson's presentation and uh, to Michelle and Rena's, and we'll do our best to have all of the links that were shared uh, and the information in that email uh, for you. I, I wanna thank each and every one of you for participating today. This election will be won by the side that turns out its voters. Volunteers contacting voters, getting them registered, talking to them about the importance of voting, getting them to vote, driving them to the polls, curing ballots. It will be volunteers that turn out our vote and win this election. It will be you that will win this election. We need you. We need you to volunteer. We need you to share the news about Volunteer Blue and all the organizations participating in it. We need you to let your family, your friends, your neighbors know about Volunteer Blue. Please use the Volunteer Blue website. There will be great social media content for you to share, volunteer opportunities for you to make use of. There'll be more Zoom events like this one. Soon we'll unveil a new app, that's what we were talking about when you came back, that you can use on your phones to ask your contacts to volunteer. Again, it's volunteers that will win this election. We are so proud of all the organizations working together to create Volunteer Blue. 
They are on the front lines of this election. And we are so proud of all of you for the work you have done and all the work you will do. I know that when our children and grandchildren ask that question, what did you do in the time of Trump? We all will be able to answer. Together, we did everything we could. Thank you so much. We're done for today. Onwards, upwards, a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you.